Well, first of all, uh, thank you for your time and coverage of North Carolina's first school performance grades. As of today, North Carolina is one of 16 states to have some system of AQF grades in place for public schools. Before I share with you the information of our AQF grades, I must first give a huge shout out to all the teachers in our state who have worked so hard last year to ensure that their students grew in academic achievement. And they are my champions. They are the people who really make a difference and growth is so important because that is one of the best measures of the impact on student learning. The grades released today show that most of our schools, 41.4%, received C's. About a fourth of our schools received B's and D's, and a small number received A's and F's. And when you consider academic growth, approximately three-fourths of our schools met or exceeded expectations for growth. So now we have our first set of grades. What does that mean for North Carolina? What does that mean for our parents? What does it mean for our students and our schools? As with any measure for schools, the letter grades provide just one quick indication of student performance and academic growth. They provide a starting point for evaluating student quality or school quality. When parents and others see their school's letter grade, I hope they will dig deeper and ask these questions. How is my child doing? Is he or she learning and growing? Did my school make expected academic growth or better? And how did similar schools perform with similar demographics? The answers to those questions are really important. The letter grades reflect performance 80% and academic growth 20%. And from a practical perspective, that means schools serving many students who began the school year behind their peers may have made strong academic growth and still not have the performance needed to bring a high grade to their school. And when the letter grades are considered by poverty levels in the schools, by the growth rates of teachers and by other factors, you will see some very interesting trends. Nearly all of the schools that received grades of F also have more than half of their children receiving free or reduced price lunch. Put it another way, some schools with high numbers of low income students receive A's. Some receive B's, C's, and D's. But all the schools receiving F's had a high number of low income children. And this speaks to the challenges that teachers and communities face when a school has large percentages of students who struggle with poverty, who struggle with where am I going to put my head tonight? What am I going to eat? Among schools receiving grades of D's or F's, more than 55% of them met expected growth or exceeded expected growth. And for schools receiving an A grade, more than 76% met or exceeded growth expectations. And that tells me that the teachers in these schools made sure that their students were growing academically. But their letter grade is more heavily weighted toward performance rather than toward growth. And of course, that pulls the overall grade down. Now let's look at our charter schools for a moment. If you look at our charter schools, you will see a high percentage of A's when compared to other public schools. And you will also see a high percentage, a higher percentage of F's when compared to other schools. And I think that reflects the fact that some charters serve certain student populations with very specific needs. Charter schools, like public schools, have pockets of excellence and also have schools that need significant improvement. And you can see more detail from this information in the executive summary packet that you have. So where do we go from here? 
At the Department of Public Instruction, we are evaluating how to provide direct services to schools that receive D or F grades. And over the past four years, we have been very successful in helping low-performing schools turn around in many cases. But the team ha that has been doing this work is expected to be cut one half of its current size next school year when federal race to the top funds in. And that's why the State Board of Education's budget request includes funds to continue these services with state dollars. And we'll also be looking at the schools that beat the odds and earn grades of A's and B's even with many challenges. And there are lessons to be learned from these schools and we intend to share this information with other schools and districts. North Carolina has a 20-year history of keeping commitment to school accountability. And the school performance grades that have been released today are a part of the latest chapter. And what have we learned over the last 20 years when it comes to improving student achievement, especially schools with high levels of poverty? Number one, teacher continuity matters. A high teacher turnover rate is extremely damaging to the schools. We also know that it is extremely valuable to have ongoing professional development for teachers in schools who have many challenges. Number two, students having access to quality preschool is critical in closing gaps and reducing referrals to exceptional children. Just review the article in the paper day before yesterday or yesterday about the study done by Duke University professors. Three, a different calendar to address the summer loss of reading and mathematics achievement is critical. Reading camps for third graders is a step in the right direction because it extends learning for our children who need extra help and assistance and time. And I'm grateful to the General Assembly for funding summer camps for third graders, but it needs to be expanded to kindergarten, first, and second grades also. Four, a coherent, planned system of extra help and assistance is critical. A little help here and a little help there will not get the job done. It must be consistent, it must be coherent, and it must be planned. And five, a support system addressing the mental, physical, and emotional needs of children who live in poverty is critical also. We know from the past that children in struggling schools can be successful. They need more help, they need more support. And all of North Carolina, including our children, will suffer if we do not take to heart the five imperatives that I have just outlined. Now I believe that our performance grades can be more transparent by having a better balance between growth and performance. And I've already started conversations about options to provide that balance and to provide parents and North Carolinians with the most comprehensive information available on public school performance. And I believe that the grades should reflect a grade for performance and a grade for growth. And of course, they could be averaged together if necessary. As you know, the letter grades released today are displayed on the newly revamped school report card site that provides new functionality for users. And that includes the opportunity to do a school-by-school -school comparison. And I want to thank our friends and SAS for helping uh, us, for being our partner. And we know that without their help, it would have been very difficult for us to have this uh, new North Carolina report card. And so I thank you, SAS. And I must call out Diane Delaney for her work over the past year to get the report card uh, right for parents. When you visit the site, parents will see the performance grade grades, but I want parents and all of you to look at more than just the performance grades. Go to the other key indicators 
of importance to our parents and to our school communities. And at this time, I also want to thank Dr. Tammy Howard and her staff. Would you please raise your hand if you're in here for the work that they have done. They have handled millions and billions of pieces of data to get to the place to have a report that you can use and that North Carolina can see. And so at this time, uh, we're happy to take questions and I'll ask uh, Dr. Uh, Tammy Howard and Ms. <coughs> Delaney to join me um, so, because I may need their assistance if you have really, really tough questions. I have one. Um, do, don't you have a really easy grading scale here? I mean, uh, if my kid uh, got a 60 uh, degree or 60 points, he'd get an F. But your schools don't get an F unless they get below 39. Well, you have to think of all grades. First of all, grades are not perfect. And um, I don't know who the czar was at one point to say that an A would be uh, 90 to 100. In fact, when I was in school, uh, just about, I think that was in 1807, <laughs> uh, an A was 95. So instead of looking at the point spread, the big idea is that you look how one is in relation to another. Uh, there are other 16 other states. Uh, you can't compare our A's to their A's because they have different schedules. So uh, I believe it's important for the uh, General Assembly, uh, instead of going to the 10-point scale next year, to go to continue with the 15-point scale. Why? Uh, one year does not a trend make. You need trends over time. But it, this isn't really a net. I mean, you'd have a lot more F's if the schools are graded in the same way as the kids were, right? I mean, if the kid brings home an F, you have an idea that they scored under 60. Well, uh, I believe, I mean, yeah, you have an idea, but you can be in some states, I've been in some classes where an F was a 75. In another school, it may be 70. Uh, you go to Virginia, my, where I was born, uh, I went to school in Bedford County. Our grading scale was 95 to 100. In order to have a, uh, you, if you got a 74, you failed. You go to the next county where I taught, uh, if you failed in that county, uh, you had to make um, a 70 or, I mean, a 69 or below. So my big point is that grades are relative, and that's one of the challenges with A through F. Everybody knows what an A is, and nobody really knows what an A is. So that's one of our challenges in explaining the A through F system to our public, because an A, you just, uh, I guess in some respects, you demonstrated my point. You're saying an F? is a school that had 70 or below. Why do you have this chart? So that is one of our challenges. Everybody knows what an A is. We all have our idea what an A is. We all have our idea of what an F is. But it isn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean the same, both for our students' grades as well as uh, when you compare the entire country and when it comes to the A through F that is being implemented in 16 states. Yes, and Dr. Atkinson, a very long time ago, the board had a focus on closing the achievement gap. Looking at the demographics and the school grades, what can you say about the effort now? Well, it is still very important to the State Board of Education and to us in the Department of Public Instruction to close those achievement gaps. We know that preschool education is critical for closing those achievement gaps. Uh, when you look at referrals to exceptional children, uh, with the children who had that opportunity to be in quality preschool education, you'll see less referrals. And in order to close the, the achievement gap, we have to recognize that some children, because they may not, um, they may not have chosen the right uh, community in which to be born, uh, need that extra help and assistance and they may not come to school with the same skills as others but if we give them enough time and enough support they can ultimately be extremely successful yes uh, obviously there's a direct correlation 
with poverty, this chart just illustrates what everyone at the gut level knows anyway. How will the policies oh, that you bring to the legislature or recommend to the policy to the legislature reflect mm -hmm. that particular mm -hmm. part of this equation? Uh, number one, uh, to uh, make sure that we uh, continue on the route of paying our teachers well, to look at ways where we can attract the most, uh, the best teachers to our struggling schools. And I don't mean uh, pittance of money such as $500 or $10, but something that would uh, attract teachers uh, and something that would require them to stay at least uh, three years. We know that teacher turnover is extremely detrimental to progress in this, uh, uh, with our students. So that would be one, to address teachers and their supports. The second is to continue with the mantra, we need to make sure that every child who can benefit, or who <coughs> we know will benefit from preschool education will have that opportunity. The uh, third notion is to continue to ask the General Assembly to stay the course with giving um, monies to have extra time during the summer for the children who are struggling. We know that our students struggle. Uh, if during the summer they lose two and a half to three months of reading progress, and then they come back to school and the teacher has to start three months behind where the teacher would have normally started. And that's even more dramatic in uh, mathematics. Uh, and then we will need, we'll continue to support having the extra help with nurses, psychologists, social workers to help to address some of the, um, the byproducts of living in poverty. Yes. Dr. Eggerson, this is sort of a general question about the ADA, ADA grading scale. So we've seen the poverty numbers. Um, they're clearly um, people in, in high poverty areas right now that are trying to understand this and probably not feeling too good about it. Do you feel like this is a kick them while they're down kind of thing? Or is this a call to action or is it something different? I mean, for, for those folks. Uh, the General Assembly uh, wanted to put an A through F system in place. They wanted to do that for transparency. I hope that the General Assembly will join us in saying that this is not I got you community, but this is a way to identify where resources need to go. I know for a fact that resources matter. In fact, some of our lowest performing schools have received um, federal school improvement grants. And when we look at the results of those school improvement grants where they got a substantial amount of money to have extra help and assistance, to have more teachers working with students, we have seen results. And so I am optimistic that the General Assembly will use these data to rededicate themselves to uh, helping the people who really need more resources to make a difference for our children. And we cannot forget that when you look at our teachers, the percent of our teachers uh, exceeding and meeting growth, we are, we are seeing teachers working really hard and they're making a difference with growth. They just need extra time. Yes. How would you characterize these scores? I haven't heard anyone say if these are good results, if this is what you expected, if this is not good for our state, if this is below what we expected, how would you characterize overall statewide these results? Uh, I would characterize these results as being just one indicator of how well our students are doing. Um, I was pleased that we did not have more S than we did. I was pleased that uh, we had such a um, the majority of our schools meeting or exceeding growth, and that's why I uh, feel that we need to have growth as a major part of the formula, that we need to look at a way to give growth more credit. Um, I guess one way to say it, that the, these grades are not as bad as many people thought they would be, and they're not as good as we want them to be. 
and they are um, a starting point. And I have faith in our teachers. In fact, when we had low performing schools and we changed standards, we saw our performance, we saw our low performing schools dip, I mean, uh, increase. And so consequently, we're seeing the similar thing with um, this, these data. Uh, we had increases from last year as far as student achievement to this year. We didn't have grades last year, thank goodness. And then this is our first year, and that is one of the reasons, again, why we need to stay the course with the 15 points and then go to a grade for growth and a grade for performance, and then we can have that transparency. If the legislature doesn't go along with this idea of extending the 15-point scale to next year, aren't a lot of schools going to get a kind of a big shock? I mean, there are going to be a lot of C's that drop to D's and a lot of D's that drop to F's. Uh, that's correct. Um, the, however, I mean, just a caveat is that when you look at the old accountability system, we saw that every year the teachers inch, I mean, you know, inch and some inch up, and others go up by dramatic numbers. And um, for the first time in the history of North Carolina, since I have been in education, we had dollars from Race at the Top to do professional development across the state and to develop materials for the standards in place. And so I think that our teachers are better prepared with the current standards today than we, than we had when we went to higher standards many years ago. So that also gives me optimism that um, our schools will continue to improve. And then we'll come back to you, John. Um, Virginia, Virginia's legislature adopted uh, a school grading model that was arguably more generous than North Carolina's. It incorporated more growth than performance. And yet there's a bipartisan effort um, moving through their legislature to repeal the school grading system. Would you be a proponent of repeal here in North Carolina? Um, I am a person who is realistic, and I don't believe that uh, our General Assembly uh, will repeal the A through F. Uh, also, you mentioned about other states. When we have done a study of the A through Fs in the other uh, states, and about the number of A's and Fs, and we made the comparison for we made the comparison with uh, National Assessment of Education Progress scores, and our system is one of, if not the most stringent grading of the other 15 states as a whole. As when you use the comparison to the NC, I mean to the nation's report card assessment of name. Yes, uh, there's a proposal to a bill that went in um, that would raise the percentage. Um, for growth to 60 percent, I believe. Would you support that? Uh, I support having two grades, one for performance and one for uh, for achievement, and then we can average them together, and that'll be 50-50. So uh, uh, we need to get to at least 50 percent for growth. I'd like to talk a little bit about the virtual charter schools. I think I can start that conversation maybe by tying it back into this. Well, again, getting to the poverty, one of the concerns we heard around that conversation was kids in areas where there is no either broadband access or they won't have it in their homes. Here we see that poverty clearly is a major contributor to school performance. Up there we're hearing about introducing a new education form that could jeopardize kids in poverty further. How do you address that? How do you account for that? Well, first of all, I believe that our public schools are the very best choice for um, overwhelmingly for our students in our state. And we have to recognize that if parents want the opportunity for their children to go to take virtual courses, we have the North Carolina Virtual School. So that's an option for them. Um, if, however, uh, I, I know that there are some parents who prefer to homeschool, prefer to uh, have total control over their children's education without sending them to a public or private school. And I anticipate that the virtual charter school will be attractive to many of those parents. I do believe 
that opportunity should be available to all, not just some. What can you say about the concerns some of the board members expressed about uh, at least one of these operations? Uh, we've seen K-12 in court before. We've, you know, obviously, we've seen concerns raised about these two endeavors specifically, but also uh, maybe you could address the concept in general. Well, uh, as we move forward, one of our goals is to have personalized learning, to have competency and mastery as the constant for our students rather than time. I believe that uh, 10 years from now, when uh, we're all sitting somewhere in this world, uh, we, will, we will have moved in education to a blended approach where for some students, we will need to have 100% uh, face-to-face instruction. For other students, 100% online may work, but I think that the most, uh, most of our students will fall in the category of wanting both online and face-to-face and our schools are moving rapidly to that point. And the virtual school, the virtual charter schools are pilots, and I feel sure that the State Board of Education will have uh, much oversight, because a child only is a child just once. And we have to make sure that children get, uh, I feel as if the board wants to make sure that those children, if they are in those virtual schools, get the necessary uh, support needed. And when these charter schools, uh, these virtual charter schools are implemented, they are required to have the same testing as our public schools. So that will give lots of information to uh, the state board at the end of next school year, when we have to do the same thing in August. I, I hate to do this, but may I just last follow? This is a pilot. You mentioned it. Uh, it's a three-year study, 15 to 16, 15 to 19, or something like that. Three, I think it's a five-year pilot. Five five year? Three. Four. 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 I was confused because it starts over the roll over to 15, 16. Isn't there a reevaluation after? Reevaluate after every year. That, that, that's, a, that's a good segue. Thank you. Um, so then the, the question is, what are your specific concerns about virtual charters as this endeavor kicks up in North Carolina for the first time? That students will not learn, that students will not have the necessary support, and you know that's a concern. Uh, however, I know the board in its charter application is uh, doing its best to ensure, as it carries out the mandates of the General Assembly, that that support will be there for those children. Yes. Going back to the school grades, um, I understand as an educator and, and perhaps a school administrator why you would want growth to play a more important role in that score. As a parent, um, when you want your child to go to a school, not just a school that's improving, but you want your child to be at a school that's already excelling. So from that point of view, why isn't this a fair and accurate, perhaps even the best representation of a school's performance if you want to pick the best school for your child? Well, uh, first of all, I do believe it is important to have performance <coughs> because if you don't, you will never, ever get to a place where you can improve student achievement dramatically. The second point is, that there are F schools in our state where students are excelling. And so just because the school may be labeled as an F does not mean that the children in that school are not succeeding and are not being very successful and, can, and those children can compete with the others. So I think if the important idea is that you have a balance. Uh, we can't be content uh, without additional uh, support with just having growth but just having a school that has 17 percent of its students at or above grade level so you, I, I think it's important to have a balance. Other questions? Well before we end I want to thank Eric Buchanan, the governor's uh, educational advisor for being here. I want to thank SAS for its being here and for its support. 
Um, they have been in our building so much with helping us that I feel as if they're on staff. <laughs> so thank you, Sam. I also appreciate uh, Representative Tricia Coffin uh, being here today for uh, this presentation. And let me end by also saying appreciation to our communication staff, to our accountability staff, and to, um, I'll have to say, our data staff for all of your work to make this day possible. So thank you for being here.